Bihanka Prino is the founder and director of Prino Careers, the unique career consultancy specializing in providing bespoke and tailored career advice to the international student community to facilitate their UK career planning. She has over 10 years of experience working in various educational settings across Europe, UK and Asia, supporting culturally diverse groups of students to transition from education into professional role. Bihanka knows all too well the unique challenges and barriers faced by international students when navigating their career in the UK context. She has supported hundreds of international students and foreign nationals with their careers, a global half look on careers and interest in how cultural differences play a fundamental role in career decision making ensures she provides relevant and meaningful careers advice to the diverse international student community. Bianca, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, I mean, we are we are so very honored to have you um, today, Bianca. I mean, looking at your over ten years of um, you know um, working experience with international students, uh, who are the main um, audience for um, this podcast, and also the employers themselves, so that they can be able to understand the story from the international student perspective. So, um, Bianca. When we talk about supporting international students in the UK job um, search, what are some of the unique challenges that international students face when searching for employment in the UK? I think, well, it comes down to kind of you don't know what you don't know. So they've come to the UK for the first time um, to even understand, then adapt to a new education system is, is one challenge. And then the teaching style and and so on. And then understanding how to navigate their career in a UK context is a bit of a minefield. So I think it comes really down to how the, the cultural differences and um, how they impact on how people navigate their careers is very overlooked. And um, so even from the, the very beginning with the CV, cover letter, formulating those documents for the UK job market, um, those cultural differences come through in those documents and the very nuances, the tone, the use of English, the way that they're writing, they're, the international students write them, how they talk about themselves and their career narrative, all of the, you know, they're bringing in their their culture into all of that as they would. And, you know, culture is something that fascinates me I think it should be celebrated you know mm -hmm. and um, very much acknowledged um, but when it becomes detrimental to how to actually navigate your career this is where you really need very specific tailored support so I'd say that you know the three unique challenges for international students is understanding how to formulate CV cover letters so the kind of the application process and um, interviews as well is a huge a huge area of um, learning where how how to conduct yourself in a UK interview in terms of etiquette, cross cultural communication, what's appropriate, what's not. So kind of you know identifying themselves in that kind of as a professional, but again in the UK context, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then the whole job search um, thing is a is a huge challenge for international students with visa sponsorship. Um, of course, we've got the post-study work visa now that allows them to work for up to two years. But it's still also some aspects of that they really understand what kind of jobs that they should be applying for. So um, MBA graduates would not be applying for the same roles as um, a student that's come off a four-year bachelor's um, degree. So um, and of course, if you if you don't know that, you don't know. It's kind of building that knowledge. And um, so those are kind of three, those are the, the, the big three areas. There's, there's lots of complexities within those, but I would say just the knowledge and the understanding and then getting the right support as well is, yeah, is the main challenges, I would say. Because of time, I hope we'll be able to cover those um, points you've just um, mentioned. I mean, you mentioned around cultural differences. Um, you know, formulating those important documents in the UK context, uh, because I mean, your years of experience would make you 
uh, you would have come across loads of CVs of different mm-hmm. formats. All right. Yeah. But we are, we are going to talk about that. Yeah. So with those challenges you've mentioned, um, how do you think international students can overcome these challenges? I think, again, just um, having the awareness that the CV that works for them in their home country is not going to work for them in the UK. So mm-hmm. you have that. That's kind of a fact. And then the minute um, they start their course to then start thinking about how they're going to change their CV so it meets the kind of the, the expectations for the UK job market. So looking at other people's CVs that are successful with getting interviews, any other international graduates or any even home student CVs. So kind of having a look out there at other CVs that they know that have worked for other people, accessing their careers and services at university and getting their CV looked over um, and they can get feedback and advice about what they can do to change it and make it a bit more UK friendly. Um, And... I think just really reflecting as well um, on what they do have to offer. So especially especially if you want to secure sponsorship, you really have to be a standout candidate. It, it's always been challenging, but it's become even more challenging with Brexit as well, as you know. So now they're, you know, they're competing against EU students as well. So there's a lot more competition if you want to secure sponsorship. But understanding, you know, what is your unique selling point using your international background to your advantage and not downplaying you know your homework experience so many international students don't put their part-time jobs on their on their CVs because it's not relevant to what the graduate job they want but it does highlight all those transferable skills and it shows that they're managing their studies against a job you know and all these all these kind of uh you know these things that make them unique and yeah, what, what is their unique selling point? They have to get that through their CV and um, doing that from day one of your course, not leaving it to the last minute um, is very, very key. And I would say having a conversation with a professional as well about, you know, pulling out of you, what are your skills? What are your strengths? Um, I think from my experience, international students, they don't tend to struggle with knowing what they want to do. They tend to really come to the UK knowing, right, I'm doing this course. This is the job that I want to get. So it's really that kind of practical information that they need. And the CV, you know, um, there's lots of um, common downfalls that international students make. You know, basic things like photos. You don't put that on your you know, UK CV, marital status, whether you're sing- you know, single, it doesn't matter. Um, blood type, all these things that I have actually seen on CVs. Um, you don't need your your passport number, you don't need things like that. So making sure that you aren't falling down on very small things that could have been avoided because your CV will be instantly rejected from, you know, applicant tracking systems and so on. Um, But yeah, CVs are, it's one of the most important documents of your life if you really think about it. And they're not easy. You know, there's, it doesn't matter what level of uh, higher education that you've studied at. I've seen PhD students who still struggle to write a CV and bearing in mind that, you know, for for some cultures as well, that kind of individualistic approach is quite unfamiliar. So talking about yourself in the way that we might do in the UK is, is not the done thing in other cultures where it's a bit more collective. So your CV is all about you, you, you. And I think a lot of um, students from different cultural backgrounds struggle with that because that's not what they're used to and they have to kind of adapt um, to kind of sell themselves as we would say that phrase um, which I don't like that phrase I would say it's more about you know highlighting your skills and what you have to offer and justifying what you've done and what you can do for an employer mm-hmm. but yeah it's um, it's yeah I go quite deep into CVs it's quite I think when you really think about it it's quite complex no, no. I mean, from what you've said, I can I can imagine it's very, very complex because I was going to ask you about, I was going to put you on, on the spot first um, as to what are the most funniest things oh, you've God. seen on the CV. But you said blood type. Why would you put a blood type on a CV? I, I have no idea. But also they put their, their parents' blood type as well. So I don't know. I don't, uh, I don't know. But actually, I did see a really... 
um, week I'll say CV recently I got sent a CV because I I've seen hundreds and hundreds of CVs and you know if I'm getting getting sent them on LinkedIn and so on I'm assuming employers are getting sent these CVs as well you know and these are yeah. people who are actually a lot of them are professionals abroad very established professionals from various countries looking to get a job in the UK with sponsorship fantastic skills fantastic experience but oh this yeah one of the worst CVs I've seen is seven pages all of that information that i mentioned that shouldn't be there you know um your your date of birth your um, nationality your all those all those things that aren't aren't required at all um, and then the picture of the person was actually like a avatar but not a quite it was like mixture of an avatar stroke human real life 3d version of the person standing on the cv and you know, I think, you know, it's these things are the things that can be avoided, you know. And wow. yeah. Seven pages. Seven pages. I've seen that quite a few times, yeah. Um and of course in the UK it's two pages maximum. You have to be quite rigorous with what you put in. Yeah. I think I think with these international students who are, are prospective international students coming to the UK should be aware of this information that whatever yeah. format it is that they are used to in their own country it's different over here and they should seek um, that professional advice. Mm -hmm. Now, one question comes out from what you just said. Now, how many pages should a CV be? Because this is this is this is an ongoing argument with both recruiters, employers, and students and professionals. So, how many pages should a CV be? Um, two pages maximum for the UK. Okay, I would say. What's if you have now? Because these are part part of the questions that international students have asked over the years. What if you have over ten years of experience? Can you compress that into a two-page CV? Yes, there are ways that you can. So you, depending on all of your experience, you can structure your CV in a way that you would have like relevant experience first, and then you'd have maybe other experience in a section. And if, for example, okay. if you had lots and lots of different part-time jobs whilst you were studying with, um, you know, in retail or hospitality, you can just put like dates and the name of the organization and, you know, um, you don't need to necessarily bullet point um, for jobs like, you know, 15 years back. But you want to ha not have gaps in your CV as well, because that can, you know, um, put up red flags for employers. So it's always better to, to put things in and leave them out. But it's all about the editing as well. So, you you know, the wording and how you, you know, being concise and succinct and and with your words and editing it all down to two pages and it, yeah it is possible okay um i'm sure that with the seven pages cv you saw you must have compressed that down to um <laughs> two pages <laughs> i've done it i've done it with five pages before um yeah but then actually yeah in the seven page if someone has a seven page cv Actually, yeah, because a lot of that information, it won't be um, relevant for the UK market. So all that kind of personal information and references as well. So you don't put names of your references and their contact details on your UK CV. So that okay. would in instantly taking that stuff away would you know instantly create space. And mm -hmm. then, yeah, so it's those kind of un those those are the unnecessary elements. OK, so now let's talk about CV now. What are the essential components a CV should have? What kind of what are the ingredients a CV should have? Yeah, like that, the ingredients of a, a good CV. <laughs> so for the UK, I would say, you know, your basic details, your name, um, your LinkedIn URL now, um, your phone number, your location. You don't need to put your full address, you can just put the city that you live in. Um, and your email address, did I mention that? Yeah, email address, but not, I wouldn't suggest putting your student email address, putting a personal or professional email address that you've created for jobs, job search purposes. And then having a professional profile section is really key, I think, because it provides context and it's really a place where you can personalize your CV. And that's where you would get across right away what's, what's your, your, 
kind of main experience, your top professional skills, your qualities, and what are you looking for now and why? So I think, yeah, and of course, that's all to do with the how you write it, how you edit it down to making make it really engaging. And then you would have your education section and then work experience. You can switch those around depending on your situation or um, what you feel is more, you know, is going to be more beneficial for you. And then having a section where you would have skills as well. So skills are things like IT skills, driving license, languages that you can speak, putting in the, the level of the languages as well. Um, and then volunteering, which a lot of international students don't put on a lot of the time. So volunteering section, and you would lay that out like you would with your work experience, you know, the dates, the name of the, the charity or organization and your role and what you did. Because obviously as a volunteer, you have duties and responsibilities and you can have extra curricular curricular section as well instead of hobbies and interests, because extracurricular is a bit more professional you know, professionalizing it a bit more. And that would be things like clubs or societies that you're involved with at university or things that you do outside of university if you're if you play team sports, things like that. And then you can have like an awards or certification section. Um and then also you could have professional development if you're doing things like um yeah any kind of kind of personal professional development. So it depends on the individual, but those kind of seven, I think it's seven sections normally give a CV a good structure and you're really then validating all of the different areas of your experience. So instead of having, which I've seen on a lot of CVs like, oh, additional information and then things like awards, achievements and volunteering are all lumped into that section, but you're not then really valuing your volunteering experience and that could be really key for you choosing the career path that you want you know you're, you're going down or that's when you could give examples and in interviews maybe from that volunteer role so really if you value it then the reader is going to value it so it's really important how you how you portray it on your cv and and the space that you give it you know thank you so much for that um Bihanka. Now, what will be the importance of tailoring your CV to a specific um, job? Because most of the time, um, some student, international student, both international student and home student, right, uh, they have just one CV and apply for mm -hmm. all kinds of jobs. So what is the importance of tailoring a CV? Should they tailor their CV? And if yes, so what is the importance of doing that? Yeah, it's an interesting question, I think, with the tailoring the CV. So I'll I'll answer this in kind of two parts. Yes, you should be like tweaking your CV for each job role. But if you're changing it immensely and a lot, then I would I would think, okay, you know, there's red flags that should be popping up there. Why am I changing my CV so much? The roles that I'm applying for should really all be requiring the same skill set because that's a skill set that I have. Um, but yes, tweaking your your CV to make sure that you have the, the key skills from the job advert in your CV. So that would be mainly in the work experience section where you're evidencing where you've demonstrated or developed those specific skills. Because if you don't do that, then your CV is going to be rejected by applicant tracking systems, which, you know, I think it's like what 80 percent of companies now use. So they type in the keywords. And your CV would be then um, shortlisted or a kind of, I um, can't remember the word, but prioritized based on you, your CV matching those words in the job advert. So, yes, it is important to do that. And I think this is where quality over quantity comes in as well. So I, I know with international students um, who really want to secure jobs with sponsorship, they it can happen that you go into panic mode and you just send out loads, you know, hundreds of applications. I've heard, you know, international students say to me, I've, I've sent like 300 applications, I've heard nothing back. Sometimes that doesn't work because, you know, it's not necessarily a numbers game anymore. It's really about you making sure that your CV matches the job advert, you know, because it's going to it's going to be filtered out 
by you know a software program before it even gets to a human and for international students it's even more important that you do that because if you want that sponsor if you want sponsorship it's more challenging so um yeah i think maintaining that focus of quality over quantity and yes tweaking your cv making sure that it matches the you know the skills required for the role thank you so much for that um Bihanka. I think I think we've been able to break the CV part now, which is part of the challenges that you know international student faces here in the UK. Uh, um, I want to believe, okay, with the worth of ex your worth of experience and the insight you've shared today, someone listening will be able to make that changes and also probably reach out to you to assist them to uh, make out those changes. I'm going to drop your um, um, details um, in the um, description box below um, mm -hmm. our YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, so, but, um, so now, Bianca, so let's talk about the other part of the document, which is the cover letter. Mm -hmm. All right. Because, um, I mean, you can correct me. When it comes to job searching in the, in the in the UK, part of the document is the CV, the cover mm -hmm. letter, and then the interview preparation. Right. Yeah. So now let's talk about the cover letter. What is the role of a cover letter in um, submitting a job application? Yeah. So I think uh, I always say a uh, um, CV without a cover letter is like a burger without a bun. Um, also vegetarian burgers, but you know, the two should go hand in hand and always get into the habit of writing a cover letter with a CV, unless the advert stipulates that they don't require a cover letter, always go to the effort to write one because then you're instantly going above and beyond other candidates who haven't been bothered to write one. So cover letters do take a bit more time than a CV. So your CV, as I was saying, like your kind of skill set will be incorporated throughout and it, it shouldn't really change. But with the cover letter, you're tailoring it to the specific role. And this is where it gets more difficult because in a lot of countries, cover letters don't exist. So for international students who've come to the UK, they've just learned how to okay write a UK friendly CV. And now they're asked to sell themselves in a cover letter. And it's again, it's that it comes down to that individualistic kind of approach that we have in the UK which is very much about I, I, I and a lot of international students feel uncomfortable with that because their cultural background is quite different and it's not about them it's about a collective you know so the mindset is quite different um, so once you know how to tackle a cover letter you know you've done it and then it's just a matter of tailoring them to, to each role and in the job how you tailor it is in the job advert, there's different sections. In pretty much every job advert now, there's the blurb about the company or the organization. They talk about themselves. Then they talk about the purpose of the role. Then they talk about the requirements of the role and what what they're looking for in the, in the candidate. And they're putting that information there for you to use in your cover letter. So... This is what you're kind of not word for word. Mm -hmm. OK, if you want to write a really sophisticated and successful one, you are using you, you're interpreting the words that they are they've given in your own way. And the best cover letters that I've seen are the ones that are written where the person provides a really good insight into how they would do that job. So they almost imagine themselves doing that job. And they take parts, you know, from the job advert um, and they make it their own and they provide evidence of, oh, that they would be able to um, work in a team to problem solve in that role because they've done this in their current role when they've had to blah, blah, blah. So it's a kind of, again, it's it's comes down to your written communication, which, again, is is can be challenging for international students because that then goes back to UK etiquette, writing style, what's appropriate, the tone, the impression that you give off with your writing style. And I think there's a lot of culture that comes into that as well. Um, and then if you think about employers reading cover letters that in a way that they feel like they couldn't relate to that person, they're not 
likely to give that person an interview, are they? Because they'll think, oh, I don't, we don't think that person's going to kind of fit into our workplace because, you know, because they're making a judgment based on what they're reading and, the, you know, how it's been written. Um, and I think, yeah, again, the cultural aspect comes into that and it can give off the wrong impression, unfortunately, you know. That person could be a great candidate and a great mm -hmm. employee for them, but just because, you know, they're not using that language of employability and, and in a way that is UK friendly and, you know, th these like very small downfalls, I think. Um, so, yeah. So that brings me to my next question from your response to that is, what is the role of communication in job search for international students in the UK? Oh, it's everything. It's absolutely everything. So, I mean, I, I get, you know, so many LinkedIn messages daily, weekly from um, also people outside the UK, like professionals, established professionals outside the UK looking for jobs in the UK and international students. And the way the, that I'm approached and the just the way the, the message is written, like, for example, um ma'am you know ma'am is very much is what you would say in nigeria for example that is how you would greet someone from you know who's a professional in in the uk you know you don't do that so when when someone writes me a message and says hi ma'am i'm looking for a job sponsorship i instantly think well you know it's off putting that is this person going to be capable to to you know to adapt to the UK work, cult work culture because they obviously aren't aware of the greeting, you know, how we would greet. And that's, you know, cross-cultural communication. That's the difference. Um, and if I, th you know, I think, oh, they're saying I'm getting these messages, employers and recruiters are most likely getting the same messages, maybe from the same people. And, you know, sometimes I look at the person's profile and they've got an amazing professional background, great experience, um, you know, a lot to offer. But if that's how you're going to construct a, a message or an email, you know, you're going to fall down on these very small things that, again, could be very easily avoided. And, you know, then it goes back to whose responsibility is this? Is it the individual's? Or is it like the universities to offer some kind of cross-cultural training? So international students are really fully equipped and really understand, okay, how to present yourself in a UK context. Because I feel like that is something that is very overlooked in it and it's something that could be very easily resolved, you know, very, and they could be very easily supported. One session, one one-hour session of cross-cultural communication, you know, for international students they would learn so much and they would um, not miss out on potential opportunities, which I think a lot mm -hmm. of them do. Um, and then going into an interview setting as well. So I had, um, so I've got on my YouTube channel, it's not, it's not the most jam packed one, but I do have a lot of Q and A's and there's um, a previous international student who is from Nigeria and she is amazing. She, she, you know, great, great student. She did a master's in marketing and she came to me not because she wasn't getting interviews. You know, she learned how to write her CV, how to do the cover letter and she was getting interviews, but she was stalling at the interview stage because she recognized that the cross-cultural communication thing was an issue and she was struggling with how to understand basically UK etiquette and how to, how to translate her you know professional identity within a UK context and you know and um, we did some coaching and then she felt more confident and more equipped and it's just you know it's a very easy kind of fix and it's like you know when I've gone to other countries I've moved to other countries I've learned things as well about things not to do in certain <laughs> In certain cultures, now I look back and it's quite funny, actually, you know, the things that I did that were not culturally appropriate. Um, you know, like when I taught English in Asia, like to do this to, um, like to do it to a child, like to go come here, that's mm -hmm. insulting. That's really insulting to do in Asia. So you have to go like this. So I had to kind of change that and adapt and 
And I had no idea that that was, that was a thing. And I was insulting a lot of kids and probably mm. they were going home telling their parents. But yeah, it's kind of, um, yeah, it comes into everything, everything with job search. Wow. So this brings me to my, um, is it, will it be a question or maybe an action, you know, for professionals like yourself? Where do you think international students can get that manual around cross-cultural um, communication? Because, mm -hmm. like, let like me, like, for example, your experience in Asia, right? You know, having to call it, I mean, in Nigeria, we call people this way. You know, in the UK, we can yeah. call it like, you know, please come, yeah. you know. Um, so where do international students get that help from to understand the cultural difference? Now, there are different aspects to cultural difference. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a career aspect. Yeah. Um, there is the um, relationship aspect. Um, I mean, we are talking about the career aspect here yeah, because I feel like, um, not I feel like, I know that cultural differences can surface in every areas of our lives when we move yeah. from our comfort zone from our own country to a different um, uh, province. So what, what or where should international students go to to go get resources to help them um, understand the um, cross-cultural communication that they will need to be successful? It's a great question. Uh, and to be honest, at the moment, I can't think of any resource that mm -hmm. really only focuses on on that aspect that is available for free for students um yeah i can't think of it and i think it's very very much needed and universities um again i do think that they have a responsibility to provide this kind of support for their international students um because it'll benefit the university's reputation um in the long run the students um, and it will also prevent mental health issues potentially with, with students as well and then becoming disheartened in their job search because they would be falling down on things that could have been avoided. And that's, you know, and a, a lot of them have to learn the hard way. You know, they learn, oh, I shouldn't have done that at the beginning. I didn't realise that I wasn't meant to put a photo on my CV or I didn't realise, you know, there's a lot of things that we assume people would know, but, you know, they don't. And even on my, you know, my professional training as a career consultant, there was no, there was no module, there was no, um, there might be now, but when I did it in 2015, there was no training about how to support individuals or students um, from culturally diverse backgrounds. And I think um, a lot of professionals don't feel confident um, to kind of approach that issue. And, you know, people can be quite, um, hesitant to approach things that are, are about culture as well because maybe we don't have the language to use for it but I find that because I had a kind of nat natural kind of interest in it and a natural kind of a uh, innate kind of desire to understand you know like oh why is it that I'm seeing the same things that this this that international students are doing you know from a specific country and then I would learn from them ah right okay that's why you know, there's all these things that I learned as well as a professional, but I feel like if you don't really, if you haven't got that kind of innate interest, it's quite easy to overlook it and think, well, I'm there to provide careers advice and, um, you know, like that's what, that's what we do. But it's, yeah, that kind of cross-cultural training piece is, is key because as we've said, it comes, it filters into everything else. How, how, you approach your job search, how you approach your CV, how you approach networking is a whole other thing, you know, about, you know, networking for international students. I mean, for anyone, it's really quite daunting, but it's like if you don't have the understanding about body language and, cross, and you know, cross-cultural communication, it's, it's extremely difficult to build relationships in a networking event. So, yeah. I want to put on the spot, Bihanka. Why did you, in your career, why did you focus on international students? Um, it's a good question. 
Well, I think I've always been interested in kind of culture and I've moved abroad in my life and I've lived in other cultures and countries and I've always seemed to kind of gravitate towards supporting students and groups of people from kind of diverse backgrounds as well because I kind of feel like they need that support they're kind of like they're at a disadvantage I feel like they're at a disadvantage and I want to be able to help them and kind of advocate you know on their behalf because I've been in in situations where I've felt different and I've I've been kind of um I've not understood things and I've not kind of um had the had the support that I really would have liked so I feel you know very much very passionate about advocating almost like on behalf of what they need you know and the international student community is so diverse within itself as well it's not just Indian students not just Nigerian it's not just Chinese you know it's it's lots of different cultures, lots of different religious backgrounds, lots, you know, so it's very, very complex. Um, so it's not just one size fits all even for international students, you know. And it's like, a, you know, like I said, I think it's just overlooked. And for me, when I was working in the university, I was like, oh, my God, like what what is going on here? Do people not realize that like they really need, yeah, cross-cultural training? They need they need help with understanding okay why it's not okay to be 10 minutes late you know you can't be 10 minutes late you need to be five minutes early in the uk um, and yeah. you need to start a question with sorry <laughs> you know that in the uk they start a question with sorry can i just ask you know very polite very you know um and i and i think i would never say that anyone would need to change themselves or change their background but it's just adapting because that's what's going to benefit you in the long run you know you're going to you're going, it's going to open more doors for you if you can adapt your communication style. Um, and I just feel that they're not getting the adequate support. And I guess I just got quite frustrated about that. And I thought, well, you know, I'm just going to go off and do it on my own. Wow. Thank you so much for doing that, Bihanka. I mean, on behalf <laughs> of the international student community in the UK and all over the world, all right. Uh, thank you so much for doing that because, I mean, you you mentioned that they are at a very great disadvantage. And um, what I've noticed in the UK is that a lot of career um, services in the universities don't have that personalized support for mm -hmm. international students. Yeah. And some universities worry why some students don't use their supports. If it's not personalized to them or if they don't see someone who looks like them mm -hmm. on the yeah. panel, they yeah. might not feel comfortable sharing their story with them. Yeah. So in a nutshell, they are at a very huge disadvantage. Yeah. You know, um, so yeah, but thank you so much for doing that. And um, I mean, I mean, you've got an amazing um, um, um record of people you you know assisted, it's not just that would you've assisted, but you're gonna share that with us today. Uh, but before we come there, um now we've spoken about um the cover letter and um the CV. Now what are the common challenges that international students face when preparing for interviews? So how can they prepare for interviews? Oh, so uh, what are the mean, challenges they face, sorry. The, the <laughs> challenges, then we're going to go to how, because we need to talk about, talk about the problem yeah. first, then mm -hmm. before we not talk about the solution, because yeah. some of them would be practicing the problem, but they mm -hmm. might not be so aware that it's a problem. Yeah. You know, so what are the challenges that they face um, when preparing for interviews? Yeah, so from what I've heard from students in my network and what, what the challenges they've really faced is, again, understanding the types of questions that they're going to be asked. And um, so, you know, competency based questions are very, very still very common in the UK. So it's very much um about using the STAR technique to answer those questions. And again, if you're not aware, if you're not aware of that, you need to learn that. But that, you know, that could be the same for kind of any any individual. But for international students specifically, again, it's that, it's that kind of um, talking about themselves. And I think a lot of the time they lack some confidence in their English, like, in English speaking skills, even though 
you know, they, I've had an international student say to me, oh, my English isn't very good. And it's very, it is very, it was very good. Um, but they don't feel it's good. So to express themselves in a language that's not their first language is all instantly going to be a bit of a, a little bit of a block for a lot of them. Um, and then it's, it's understanding, uh, being confident in your narrative as well. So being confident in, okay, well, why do you want to stay in the UK? You need to be prepared for that question. You need, you need to know your why. Why do you want to stay in the UK? Why do you want to work in the UK? Um, you really need to be able to showcase why you're the strongest candidate as well. Again, if you want sponsorship, it's more challenging. So, you know, if you want sponsorship, you're going to have to go above and beyond in interviews. Um, and there's the whole kind of body language, cross-cultural communication, you know, non-verbal cues as well. Um, which again, if you don't know, you don't know. Um, and things like, you know, I can give an example of I did when I used to be a career consultant in a university with Indian students, I would notice that they would, when I'd be speaking, they would kind of shake their head. It looked like they were shaking their head. And I didn't realize that if they weren't shaking their head in India. That's kind of nodding their head. So if they go into an interview situation and do that, and unfortunately the employer doesn't know what I know, you know, they might actually be thinking, oh, they're like, why are they shaking their head or, you know, and obviously the employer, the interviewer has got a bit of responsibility there as well to have some kind of cultural awareness, of course. But, you know, the chances are they might not have that. And these these small things, you know, that kind of piece about interview skills coaching, you know, for international students, I think should be different as well. It should be about building their confidence about, OK, you're not from the UK. That's OK. That's fine. That's great. But you need to go into that interview with confidence and you need to know how to adapt your communication style and but still be yourself at the same time. And also valuing your homework experience as well. So, you know, M students on MBAs, predominantly, you know, international students, they've got so much work experience from their home country. But the way they talk about it can be really, you know, they're not, they're not valuing it. They're not really showcasing, well, you know, I was in a management position. Okay, it might have been in a school and now you want to go to a corporate environment. But that doesn't matter. You've still got the management and leadership skills. So, yeah, there's it's complex. There's a lot there, but I think a lot of it is to do with the UK, un, the etiquette side of things, and then the confidence in yourself as an international candidate. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for that, um, Bianca. So we spoke about the challenges. Now, I mean. Um, I was very, very surprised around, you know, the experience with internet, uh, with Indian students, you know, nodding their heads. I mean, I watch a lot of Indian films. You're, you're, you're right. I know that. But yeah. it's uh, players are not going to be aware that they are accepting or listening to what you're saying. So with interviews, right, um, what are some of the key strategies or techniques that international students can use to effectively communicate their skills, experiences, and value during interviews? Yeah, well, I think it's all in the preparation. So um, being prepared for the kind of questions that you're going to be asked. So you can kind of predict, you know, you're, you're going to be asked, um, why have you applied for this role? Um, what do you have to offer? Why this company? Um, why? What do you have to offer this role? So I think really writing down those the answers for those questions and not memorizing them word by word, but then, you know, breaking it down into maybe three or four bullet points to, so you can be kind of prompted and you kind of have them in your, the back of your mind. Um, but you need to put the, the reflection into that and sit down and really know how you're going to tell your, tell your story, to, you know, and talk about yourself. So, you know, kind of tell me about yourself. That's a very loaded question that if people just tend to just relay off their CV, 
But in the UK, the, the, what the employers want to know is more than what they've seen on your CV because they've invited you for the interview. And it's that balance between your interpersonal skills and your technical skills. So your interpersonal skills are really, really key in the UK. And they're looking for that kind of culture fit. They're not just focusing on your technical skills. Um, other countries put more emphasis on you know um, academic achievements and also technical skills. But in the UK... They want a bit of everything, really. They want a holistic person. So I would say having an answer, you know, that you've written out and that you kind of know roughly about, tell us about yourself, because you're always going to be asked that. And then it's matching your, you know, having some examples of where you've demonstrated certain skills, but you're using the skills that they've put in the job advert, because most likely they're going to ask you questions about those skills. So looking up competency based questions or tell, tell me about a time that you problem solved. So you need to have an example of a time that you problem solved. And again, it's about you and what you did. And if you use the STAR technique, the, you know, starts, it stands for situation, task, action, result. Um, you know, the action part is like 70% of your answer. And it's really about what you did in that situation. Um, and that's okay to talk about yourself and you know, that kind of, you're not boasting or you're not showing off. It's it's just you're evidencing what, what you've done and where you've added value. Um, so really, yeah, kind of making a, a list of those skills that are in the job advert and then having examples. And yeah, and it gives you so much more confidence going into the interview and also always having questions prepared to ask them. And this is another thing about what what is appropriate to ask them in the interview. So nothing about salary, nothing about holidays, the things that you actually really want to know about. No, you don't ask any of those. <laughs> you have, you know, asking questions about professional development training opportunities or what would a day in, in this job kind of look like? Um, what would be the potential challenges of the role? You know, things that, you know, that show that you're interested in the actual role. And what you want to do in the interview is, you know, have you want to be leaving with a discussion you know you're, you've kind of built a rapport um you've turned you know your questions have created a discussion and you leave on a note where you've kind of made an impression a good one and you've created a, a rapport and a discussion that's really what you want to be able to do and again that can be challenging as an international student um with all the you know, all the trying to be UK etiquette, UK friendly, and you've got all that in your head. But practice makes perfect, you know, preparing those answers and then having a mock interview, recording yourself, watching yourself back, seeing what your body language is like, getting feedback, get, you know, all the support you can possibly get before the, any interviews. In interviews, so we've seen common mistakes um, where um, a candidate is talking about a old team which they belong to and yeah. using words like we. So what do you advise those kind of people that concentrate so much on what the team, uh, the team has done compared to what they have done themselves? Yeah, I think it's just, again, practice and really um, just having that awareness that it is about what you've done. You know, they they want to know what your role was in that team you know even if you're in a team of course you know there's a we there but everyone plays a different role in a team so there's some you know maybe someone that's quite supportive maybe someone's a natural leader someone is a good listener you know all you know so it's uh, they want to see that you understand what kind of role you play in a team and it you know it comes with practice you know um as well and of course interviews are you know they're not natural situations you're bound to be a bit a little bit nervous and that's understandable um but you know you know if if you don't what's the phrase if you fail to prepare prepare to fail you know mm. um you it's all it's all in the the preparation and and practice and getting feedback yeah yeah thank you so much for that bianca i mean the reason why i ask that question is because I've heard quite a number of mistakes in interviews. I mean, I've yeah. had opportunity to interview one or two few few people, you know, some international students and home students. And when you talk, when you ask them the question, tell us about a time 
you know, where you have to deal with a difficult team member. Uh, so they kept talking about the we, we element, but we only concerned about what you as an individual, because you mm -hmm. are the one who have made the application for the job. Yeah. And it is you we want, we are looking to maybe want to employ. So we want to know about you and not your team. How can you make impact yeah, on exactly. our own team? Yeah. Let us let us know the experience you've had in others' yeah. team that you can bring on board to our team. So is I just wanted that to be clear to international students. That was why um, yeah. I asked the um question. But thank you so much for that um, um comprehensive insight, Bianca. So um, um Bianca, so can I just say one thing? Sorry about yes, please. Yeah, um, yeah. On that note, yeah. So if you're ever asked about, oh, tell us a time when you've had conflict in a team, or tell us a time when you've had a challenge working in a team, you know, never ever using any negative language. So any, any, you know, saying, oh, I had a team member that was very difficult, or a team member that really um wasn't good you know because remember the interviewer doesn't know you and they don't know what happened in that situation and it's always better to remain quite diplomatic and kind of impartial and using different uh, ways to say that like oh there was a team member who was having personal issues which impacted on their ability to contribute to the team so you know that's something that's um and again that can come down to use of english as well um but yeah, that's quite important to remember to kind of avoid any any words that would give any negative connotations. That is an expensive tip you've given out there. But thank you so much for that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so now let's talk about, can you provide me like, you know, an example on how international students can approach the questions around visa status? Yes, that's now, because, Yeah, because um, before Brexit, a lot of employers don't talk about visa. It's after when um, they've gone through the um, application process, about to onboard then, maybe it's doing mm. a background check that they know that they actually require visa to mm -hmm. um, work for them. But after Brexit, a lot of employers are now aware of the visa requirements, right? right? And uh, what we saw is that there was a hundred percent increase in the numbers of companies getting licensed to sponsor, which is interesting, right? Mm. So can you tell us about how international students can address that question about their visa status or work eligibility during interview in a, in a confident and positive manner? Yeah, it's a... Uh... Yeah, it's a complex one. Yes. So um, the, I would suggest that uh, having confidence and being informed, for, firstly, for yourself, you need to know where you stand. So with the post-study work visa, um, you have, you know, the right to work in the UK for up to two years or three years, depending if you're doing a PhD or not. Um, and so when an employer asks you, do you have the right to work in the UK? You would say, yes, I've got my, uh, I can work for, uh, yes. Or you can say yes, or you can say yes, I can work for up to two years, which I've been told does put some employers off because they don't want someone just for two years and that can create some hesitation. Um but yes, you have you have you can work without sponsorship. Um if they then come back with more questions, again, you need to be informed, you need to be confident to have those conversations. Um, I've had you know clients who have had to have difficult conversations with employers when yeah they've been offered a job and then the employer says oh we didn't realize you you needed a sponsor you know you needed sponsorship and some sometimes employers are willing to actually go through the process to obtain a sponsor license it's not as complex and expensive as they think and if they really want that candidate um they will then do that and sponsor the the candidate. Other ones will say, yeah, we don't really want to do that. And, you know, you kind of have to use your judgment and think, well, do they, yeah, is, would they negotiate? Would they not? Are they really, is it a firm no? And then you would leave it, you know. But, um, yeah, I think it's, there's a lot of work that has to be done with employers on, on the employer side of about the visa and their, you know, their awareness of the process. You know, they need to be more educated about it. And, 
it's really disheartening when students get to the last part of a you know recruitment process and then they're told oh we can't sponsor and I think that's not not no fault of their own and I think they've probably benefited from still going through the process more than they have would have been if they said at the beginning do you sponsor oh no okay well and then they wouldn't have had that experience of getting into going through the interviews and building up their experience um but yeah it, it can be disheartening um but you need to know what where you stand you need to know what your options are and I would even suggest um, knowing a good um, immigration lawyer that you can actually refer a, a company to because that's happened as well with um, previous uh, clients where they've had to get an immigration lawyer involved to help the company. It can go so many different ways, that conversation, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like some people put that on their CV, you know, I need visa sponsorship or and or even I've got the post-study work visa but I would say just maybe don't mention that until they mention it. I mean, there's other ways that you can approach it. You you can look up to see if they have a sponsor license. You know, there's tools that you can do that. And um, so you can see if they could potentially sponsor you. Um, So you, at least you would know that. But yeah, it's, it's a, it's a difficult one, but it is possible, you know. <laughs> Thank you for that, Bianca. Uh, yeah, I knew I put you on the spot there because, I mean, most of, most of the time, what international students don't realize is that they actually have the rights to work in the yeah. UK. And some of that, they convince themselves or they confuse themselves mm -hmm. thinking that they don't have the rights to work. They do actually have the rights yeah. to work. Because yeah. the law on their um, visa states that they can work 20 hours during term time Mm -hmm. And more than that, when they're not on time. Yeah. Um, so they tend to struggle a lot with that. That's why I ask the question so that yeah. they can have a better understanding. Say yes, you have the right to work. In yes, ah, yes, with the part-time jobs as well. Yes, of course, they can work, yeah, two, what, 20 hours and then full-time um, in not term time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, again, I think... But then, then that's that makes it difficult for a lot of them because if you, yeah, I think the twenty hours thing I really disagree with as well because, um, you know, if you work a part time job in retail or hospitality, you know, you're asked to work, you know, extra hours. You know, what do you say? Oh no, I can't do that because you know it's twenty hours. I can only work, and then that that potentially puts employers off. And I think a lot of international students then end up getting cash in hand jobs and they get exploited and they get paid a lot less than they really should be. Um, and I think that 20 hour a week thing is is really bad. And there was a petition about it like a year or so ago. I don't know what happened about it, but I did sign it. And yeah, for me, it's like that's another thing that kind of penalizes them. And they can't also there's lots of other types of jobs that they can't do what, you know, as an international student. Mm -hmm. um so how can they potentially get some experience maybe if they want to be like entrepreneur but they're not allowed to work self they're not allowed to be self-employed and i just think yeah it's one of those other things that really it makes That's it more difficult for them even to get a part-time job it does it really does because then the employer's like oh oh well i can't guarantee that you're not going to work 21 hours maybe and mm. they'll be scared of then getting because they they would get fined for that, not the student. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. So, but on just on the last note, because of the time, um, so can you share with us any success stories or example of um, an international student who have successfully overcome obstacles and found uh, fulfilling employment in the UK? I mean what are uh, the lessons we can learn from their experiences? Yeah, so I've got a few people again on my YouTube channel telling their stories. There was one student that comes to mind, like one of the, the first students that I worked with on an ongoing basis. So she was studying um, in Edinburgh and um, she's originally from Turkey and fantastic student, you know, great, great academic achievements and was doing very well was applying for jobs for months and months and months before she came to me and she'd access you know all the support at the university as well 
um, but she was still stuck and she was really just could not get interviews. She just could not secure, you know, and she was sending out CVs, cover letters. She knew what kind of job she wanted and she had already some experience from volunteering and part-time job. Um, so I worked with her, with her, her CV, cover letter, and then she really under, she said like, oh, I understand now how to tailor my cover letter. I know now how to write it. I know now the CV, how the skills, um, you know, in the in the experience section, how I, you know, formulate those bullet points for my skills that I'm actually demonstrating that I've used them. And so she kind of got it, you know, and she worked, you know, she put in the effort and time as well. And then, you know, she started getting interviews and then then there was the challenge with the interviews as well. Uh, and she did lack a bit of confidence, I would say, with communicating herself and expressing herself in English, even though her English was very, very accurate. And she felt like her fluency was quite, yeah, she wasn't able to express herself like in her native language, which is, of course, is true. But then, you know, you kind of have to try and think in English and, um, you know, that takes practice and time. And so she then, you know, perfected the interviews as well, went on to get a job um, working for a charity in Edinburgh. And then now she's working in a university in, in London um, and, she, you know, with sponsorship as well. Um, yeah, so she's kind of, you know, that's been the last two years. I've kind of followed her journey and... I mean, that's her story, but that story resonates with a lot of other international students as well, where, you know, they build up the the knowledge. And once they know, it's like, ah, right, OK. And then they can go off and do it by themselves. You know, it's just that wee bit of support and understanding and insight. And yeah, and then it's kind of like, you know, they've got the the academic requirements. They've got the work experience a lot of the time, but it's just translating it into that UK context and matching it to the UK job market and just really believing that you know you can be a UK success and yeah lots of people have done it um and it is possible um but it does take perseverance determination self-belief hard work um yeah and consistency as well I would say Thank you so much for that, Bianca. I mean, from what you've shared, one of the things I was able to pick up from there is that international students should put in the effort and they should understand that it takes time. It's not an overnight success thing, so it takes time. So thank you, thank you so much for that, Bianca. And uh, I just want to put this out there, that uh, Bianca has been a huge support of Inscanate even before our launch. You know, yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much for that. I mean, we've not put anybody's contacts on our YouTube channel before. All right. But we are doing this because, I mean, you have been a support of Iskanet for a long time, you know. Yeah. But yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, 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 Bianca. And thank you so much for your time today. Um, it was really, really um, 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 insightful. And I'm sure that the audience are also going to, you know, enjoy this exceptional episode with you. So thank you so much, Bianca. You're welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me along. It's been a pleasure. Um, and I'll say, I will say that, um, you know, for for students who really want some kind of support, you can access um, on my website. There's like lots of free content and um, lots of articles about CVs, cover letters, and all the stuff we've been talking about. And um, I'm potentially going to be starting up my free Q and A sessions as well. So um, they're going to be on Wednesdays and they're free to attend and you can come and ask any questions at all, you know, about um, UK job search, CVs, anything like that. So, yeah, because, yeah, the support is, is, is there and I'm happy to, to keep providing it. But thank you so much for having me as a guest. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you, Bianca. I want to ask a question. Um, so on what platform would they be reaching out to you on your Q&A? Is it going to be... LinkedIn. LinkedIn is okay. the best place because I just put, I promote things on there. Um, I've also got a newsletter um, which um, people can subscribe to. It's It's been a bit, it's kind of died down since I was on maternity leave, but I'm going to start it up again. So yeah, signing up to the newsletter and just following me on LinkedIn. And then that's where I'll promote the, the free Q&A sessions and any kind of 
yeah, videos I do or articles that I put out there. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's great. Um, um, we are going to put the, the all information on how to contact um, Bianca. Uh, thank you once again, um, Bianca, and have Thank a nice you. Evening, okay. You too. Take care. Right. Yeah. Bye.